Welcome back to One Decision. I'm your host, Julia McFarlane. India is at a crossroads. An important counter-terrorism partner for the United States, a key regional partner of Asian countries anxious about a rising China, the world's largest democracy is finding itself being pulled in two directions, between the US and its allies, and on the other side, Russia, China, and the anti-Western alliance. Ambassador Sham Saran, the former foreign minister to India, sat down with One Decision to ponder India's current place on the geopolitical map and to explain its policy of avoiding having allies in favour of having partnerships, more casual commitments to its friends and neighbours, often based on trade. High on the agenda, of course, is India's manoeuvring amid the rising threat of China, which is also the subject of his fascinating new book, How China Sees India and the World. I would really recommend it if you're curious, not just about the relationship between these two Asian giants, but also on Chinese history and why its history can explain the lens through which Beijing sees and behaves in today's world. Let's go straight to our discussion. Sham Saran is a former career diplomat who served as the foreign minister of India between 2004 and 2006 under Manmohan Singh. And he has been ambassador to Myanmar, Indonesia and Nepal. He's now a fellow for both the Lowry Institute and the Centre for Policy Research, as well as a columnist for the Hindu, the Indie Express, Business Standard and The Print. Sham is also an author. A few years ago, he published How India Sees the World and his latest book, which is out now, is called How China Sees India and the World. Sham, welcome to One Decision. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for joining. Now, I wanted to start off by saying that in my reading of the position that India now finds itself in, not just currently, but throughout the last few years, and especially since the fall of the Soviet Union, I get the sense that if India were to have some kind of theme song or anthem, it would be that excellent song called Stuck in the Middle with You. And I think coming from a Western point of view, we really take for granted some of the competing interests and power struggles within Asia. I think because we're so preoccupied with framing geopolitics through this binary, bipolar frame that analyzes everything through how it relates to China and the United States' rivalry. And there's been some attempts to sort of correct away from it uh, with all these trilateral and multilateral organizations and partnerships as one way of sort of drawing attention to some of the more interesting alignments that you see around the world. And that is where you see India as kind of omnipresent in a lot of these organisations. It's in the BRICS, the emerging economies of Brazil, Russia, India and China. It's also in the Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which includes the United States, Japan, India and Australia. It's also in the RIC, which is the Russia, India, China tripartite group. And it's in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is China and a number of its regional Asian partners, too. And so India sort of masterfully manages to be friends with everyone and yet it's allies with no one. And it's a position that's been described as the sort of principle of strategic autonomy. Now, where that stance, I think, can create tensions is probably best illustrated at this particular moment when it comes to Ukraine. India has rather angered the West recently for how it's been dealing with this crisis. It's avoided condemning Russia's invasion. It abstained in a vote in the UN Security Council. It abstained in a vote in the UN General Assembly. India has this opportunity to engage diplomatically in external conflicts. But is it choosing not to? Because at the end of the day, India always has India's own interests first. Well, let's start with the last statement. Uh, I suppose every country has its own interests in mind. Uh, So India is not an outlier in that uh, respect. Um, Also, I do not think that when we talk about non-alignment or strategic autonomy, that implies that India is somehow sitting on the fence or it is not taking positions. Uh, It is a matter of, you know, uh, what the issue is and whether it is important for India uh, to take a stand. uh, And even if it is has taken a stand, uh, is that stand going to be expressed uh, in language which is condemnatory or language which is very, uh, you know, aggressive uh, or uh, interests are better served by uh, perhaps dealing with issues uh, in a somewhat quieter uh, kind of a frame. 
so uh, I see that uh, on the particular issue that you have spoken about uh, on uh, Ukraine, uh, the India position that India has taken, let me say uh, very clearly that because India abstained on the UN resolution does not therefore mean that India supports uh, Russia. I think it should be fairly clear from the statements which have been made by the Indian representative at the UN uh, that India has in fact very categorically uh, stated that you know territorial integrity, sovereignty, these are inviolable principles and has also uh, drawn attention to particularly when there have been very major uh, human rights violations like the Bucha uh, affair, for example, India has taken actually a fairly, you know, explicit and very, you know, critical uh, stand on that issue. So I think um, there is disquiet in India about what has been happening in Ukraine. Uh, it is not supportive of uh, Russia. But yes, you are right that India has not taken an explicitly condemnatory kind of a position. Uh, you said that the West is angered by India. That is not the impression that I have uh, because, yes, it is certainly to be expected that our friends will try and persuade us to join them in whatever position they have taken. Uh, that is par for the course. Uh, but I think in terms of our engagement with our Western partners, whether it is the U.S., or Western Europe or Japan, uh, in fact, uh, there is a, a fair degree of understanding why India is where it is. Uh, so I do not think that uh, India is in some way, you know, sort of discomfited because it is find itself, you know, torn between <laughs> two sides or walking a tightrope. Uh, that's not quite the position that India is. Well, I want to ask because Surely actions speak louder than words. And while you're very, very right to point out that India had words of condemnation against atrocities such as the Bucha massacre, uh, I'm reading today that uh, that India has increased its imports of Russian crude by 700%. Uh, it is jumping at the opportunity to buy cheap crude from Russia as Russia scrambles to find new customers in Asia because it is being heavily sanctioned by the West. And in that sense, it is throwing a lifeline to Vladimir Putin, is, is it not? Uh, no, because uh, when you are talking about a 700% increase, that 700% increase is on a purchase earlier of a very tiny amount of oil from uh, uh, from Russia. Uh, if you compare what India, even with 700% increase, is buying from Russia, it is a small drop in the ocean compared to what Europe is still buying from uh, Russia. It is still quite a symbolic move, is it not, that it is accepting business with Russia at a time when the West is trying to put a stranglehold on Putin in order to curb his war in well, Ukraine? The, uh, the simple simple uh, fact is that the West has very selectively put a stranglehold on Russia. But what I want to uh, point out is that these sanctions, these sanctions are not put by India. These are not sanctions which have been put by the United Nations. And we have always consistently stated we are ready to apply sanctions which have been, uh, in fact, imposed by the United Nations. But we should not be asked that because certain selective <laughs> sanctions are taken by one country or the other, that India must jump and fall in line. Uh, why sh uh, should we be expected to do that? And secondly, as a result of these sanctions, a tremendous amount of economic damage has been done to India. You know, we are heavily dependent upon, you know, energy imports, for example. We are very heavily dependent upon many other items that we get, you know, from the world market. All these have been disrupted. Uh, so, uh, surely India is entitled to also try and safeguard some of its economic interests. You know? that, that's, that's absolutely fair enough. And I do want to... I, I do want to move away from Russia and Ukraine and start to talk and, and talk about China. But lastly, before we move on from this topic, I want to ask you, Russia is an, it's the overwhelming provider of military equipment to India. I believe it accounts for nearly 70% of its defense and arms imports. That's this is obviously a, uh, a hugely important 
factor to consider when you look at how India is responding to the war in Ukraine and, as you say, balancing um, its needs and its priorities. But India is also friendly with Ukraine. You mentioned that it relies on on lots of imports from Ukraine as well. So I want to ask you, what is what is India's most important factor uh, in this conflict? What, I, what is what is the most important trade relationship in this scenario or strategic partnership that India is pro- prioritizing above all uh, in this conflict that is forcing a lot of nations to pick a side? So let me uh, try to give you a certain uh, context uh, within which, you know, these decisions are taken. Uh, one, I would like you to perhaps appreciate that India-Russia relations are not Indo-Soviet relations. So up to 1990, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, yes, India and the Soviet Union had a very strategic partnership, which was very much focused on the common threat from China, which is a very strong ally of China uh, today. And the uh, defense hardware relationship that you're talking about, uh, it is in terms of spares and maintenance that the dependence is quite high. Uh, It may be close to 70 percent, as you mentioned. But as far as fresh supplies of hardware are concerned, they do not amount to more than about 36 to 37 percent. And they are in categories which we are not able to get from other sources. Uh, For example, our nuclear submarine program, it has been very much assisted by what we get from uh, uh, Russia. Uh, There is also the SS-400, you know, uh, missile system, uh, which we have got from uh, Russia. Uh, But if you look at the trajectory, the trajectory is that India's dependence on Russia has been progressively declining, partly also because Russia is selling the same armaments to China, which it is to India. And that's not a very comfortable position for, for us to be in. That, that makes a lot of sense. India's relationship with Russia has obviously evolved from the Cold War when it was very close to the Soviet Union. But China was able to manipulate that during the missile crisis in 1962, when it knew the Russians needed Beijing and Mao was able to force Khrushchev to row back on his support of India during the Sino-Indian War that happened that same year. Today, you have a partnership that's largely based on trade and geopolitics, since India's location means that it has anxieties about Chinese influence in its region. So how is Russia getting closer to China affecting India? There's big consequences uh, for one, India's defence market and the South China Sea conflict. Uh, There's the Indo-Russian BrahMos cruise missiles, which are sold to the Philippines. And the Philippines have perhaps the biggest grievances against Chinese expansionism in the South China Sea, uh, as do both Vietnam and Indonesia, who've both expressed an interest in purchasing those cruise missiles. So what happens then if the Chinese then start to leverage the dependence that the Russians have on them now in that particular sphere of conflict in the South China Sea? If uh, Russia is much more beholden to China than it is today, then yes, (laughs) there could very well be a shrinking of the space uh, that Russia enjoys today. Uh, Now, as far as the BrahMos missiles are concerned, they are not being manufactured in a joint venture, but India has now, you know, acquired that uh, technology and the uh, IPR and has uh, done a lot of uh, its own research uh, on that particular system. And therefore, uh, it it is uh, now allowed to sell uh, the uh, missiles uh, to whoever they wish to. I mean, it is Indian decision with regard to whether the political you know, uh, sort of judgment is that, yes, this can be supplied. So, uh, so far, we have not seen any kind of pressure from Russia uh, that, uh, you know, it, 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 it will have to be consulted uh, when it comes to the uh, to uh, the sale of such uh, weapons. But I'm conceding your point that if Russia becomes much more dependent upon China than it is today, then there could be, conceivably, there could be a pressure on Russia to diminish its defense relationship with uh, India. No doubt about that. But let me also add 
that the situation is more complicated than that for the simple reason that thanks to the Ukraine war, much of the supply line of defense hardware from Russia itself has been disrupted. You know, because a lot of things the Russians need themselves uh, in terms of spares and maintenance. The other aspect which most people do not recognize is that, you know, in the old Soviet Union, it was Ukraine which was the engineering base of the Soviet Union. So even when the Soviet Union collapsed and Ukraine became an independent country, a large number of weapon systems, components and sometimes very significant components did not come from Russia. They were coming to us from Ukraine. So immediately, I'll, just to give you an example, we have bought four uh, very modern frigates uh, from uh, Russia. But we can't use those frigates because the marine engines come from Ukraine. <laughs> so that has been disrupted. Huh. So and, uh, just to make the point that the situation is somewhat more complicated than what appears uh, mm. always uh, in outside. Yeah, when it comes to geopolitics, that's always the case, isn't it? Nothing is ever as simple as you think it's going yeah. to be. It sort of sounds like India's relationships are more issue-led than ideologically based or dealing with one single partner at a time, which makes a lot of sense. I do very much want to talk to you about your book, though, because I found it absolutely fascinating. There was this very interesting quote that you gave where you said, and I quote, in China, religion was sometimes harnessed by the state to advance its interests, but mo most often this was done to prevent religion from threatening political power in India. In the state, its different incarnations proved by and large to be remarkably accommodative of different religious persuasions, despite periods of violent persecutions or of adherence of this or that state faith. This was also because the state in India intervened less in the lives of ordinary citizens than was the case in China. When what was striking about both countries is that immense diversity. But while China has a certain preference for strong central authority, India's strength may lie in managing diversity. Now I have to ask you, Sham, Prime Minister Modi, he's been very criticised for his Hindu nationalist agenda. And India has, by many accounts, regressed from a pluralist or at least a more pluralist society than it is today. So I just wanted to get your opinion on religious freedom in India and should its non-Hindu minorities feel concerned at all at the direction that Modi is taking the country in? So uh, let me uh, make it very clear that uh, some of the things that are emerging in India, uh, these uh, do cause uh, concern. I mean, certainly for somebody like me, uh, it is a matter of concern, which is why I have written what I have written in the book. Um, because... Uh, I do believe that uh, the great asset which India has, the great strength which India has, precisely lies in its proven capability of handling immense diversity, not regarding diversity as a threat to the state. That it is a, a, a strong state is compatible with a very plural society. And I, I think in the early years of India's independence and even in history, uh, this has been largely the case because we are a very diverse country. Now, I also believe that even if there are attempts made to try and put some kind of a monochrome frame over this uh, vast diversity, it is not likely to succeed. Right, but, but so Modi I and think, the BJP uh, have this Hindu nationalist agenda, do they not? And uh, how well, worried they, are they you? They certainly about? have a belief they certainly have a belief that, uh, you know, uh, in terms of India regaining its confidence, in terms of India, you know, being able to uh, project its power in the world, uh, you know, it has to it has to go back to sort of uh, original principles, <laughs> as, it, as it were. Uh, but uh, uh, even that is not fully you know, the accepted accepted ideology of even the ruling uh, party. You know, that even amongst them, there are <laughs> very uh, big uh, differences. So what I'm trying to put across is that, yes, there are certain things which are happening, certain trends which do uh, cause uh, concern. But ultimately, I'm optimistic about India's prospects for the simple reason that it has never proved to be possible in the past 
what would your advice to Prime Minister Modi be? Would you advise for him to go to move away from his divisive nationalist rhetoric? Well, I'm not so sure that he is uh, bought into a divisive, you know, national strategy because I think there is a lot of experimentation going on. What works, what does not work uh, politically. Uh, but, you know, at least the kind of message that he has been giving. The message is that, you know, uh, what we represent is being together with all sections of our society, wishing for the development of every single person in our society. We want to have the faith and the trust of all Indians, irrespective of their caste, creed or religion. So at least the messaging is very much <laughs> very inclusive. I believe that India will uh, will uh, flourish, that the plurality of India is in fact its strength. That, that that's that that's um I think I think that's a really really important point as somebody who comes from Indonesia which is full of lots of different languages and lots of different cultures and lots of different religions exactly. as well. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Indonesia Indonesia has Indo because of the fact it looked at India <laughs> mm. as a cultural cultural inspiration. You know, yeah. uh, also a country which was. Uh, you know, their their slogan is unity in diversity. Exactly, exactly. They don't always live up to that expectation, but they do. I I, I think it's yes. as uh, while so it's... It, is, it is the same, I would say, with India, <laughs> that we also <laughs> claim unity in diversity. We may not always live up to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let's try. Let's try at least. Thank you uh, so much, Sham Saran. Thank you for joining us on One Decision. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I very much enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Ambassador Sham Saran there. And now we welcome my partner in crime, Sir Richard Dearlove, for his take on the conversation. So obviously there are a lot of um, really uh, interesting things that the ambassador brought up in, in our interview. And I suppose that I think given what's happening with the situation between Ukraine and Russia, I suppose the, a good place to start would be uh, hearing your thoughts uh, on the ambassador saying uh, that just because India abstained on the UN resolutions, he says, therefore, that does not mean that India supports Russia, uh, he, claiming that India has actually taken a very critical stance on, on Russia. And he mentioned the, the massacre in Bucha and that there has been disquiet in India about what's been happening in Ukraine. I mean, do you what do you make of that? Do you do you buy his argument? Well, to an extent, yes, I do. I think that you have to accept that India is in quite a complex situation in having, as it were, to decide how it behaves, A, in relation to the West and B, in relation to Russia. And to put it in context, you know, it's had in the past a very, very close relationship with Russia, particularly in the area of armaments. Um, and also the political relationship has been close. But I mean, one of the most significant changes internationally, which I mean, largely went uncommented and unobserved, is that during the Bush administration, um, I, India really shifted its politics quite significantly and moved much, much closer to the West. And I mean, I would argue that one of the great um, achievements in foreign policy of the Bush administration, and it's not credited with many, but this was an important one, was really to bring India out of the non-aligned camp and partially into the Western camp. And that having been said, I think India is still quite cautious about how it talks about itself. And I, I think my comment is that I would see India as a potential ally, but that doesn't mean we should expect India to behave in the way that we would like India to behave and fully support us because India's relationships are complex and it's just not going to do that. So India's always been a tricky and difficult sort of post-colonial partner. But on the other hand, I think it's a very, very important one. And I would largely accept his explanation of why India had abstained in the UN vote on Ukraine, 
rather than voting with the West, which I don't think we ought to be particularly concerned about. Do, is China India's biggest security concern or is it still Pakistan? And is that also perhaps uh, a, a dimension to it, given the US and its longstanding relationship with Pakistan and the amount that it's, it, 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 it sends to Pakistan in aid historically? I mean, is that why India has always been a bit funny about partnering up with the West well, it's complicated, but yes, to an extent, I think that you know, the, the the drift of that question is is correct. I mean, obviously, India's regional view, and I mean that immediate regional view, is dictated by its relationship with Pakistan, and of course, it's complicated because of Pakistan's nuclear pro nuclear weapons program, which has been more advanced than the indian program and i would Im i mean i'm out of touch now with the detail but i would guess that it's still more advanced than it was and i mean the problem in the area is that pakistan because of the preponderance of the indian conventional military capability has a policy of first use for nuclear weapons that that makes sense. I I hadn't realised that its nuclear weapons program was more advanced than the Indians. Although I, I, d I don't know much about the Indians' nuclear weapons program, other than the fact that their apparently their main warhead is called the Smiling Buddha, which I just absolutely love. <laughs> I'm not sure where they are now, but I mean, I would say my guess, and it is an informed guess, is that the Pakistani program is still more more significantly advanced. But the problem is that. You know, if there were a new war between India and Pakistan, the Indian military would probably run over the, the the northern Pakistani plain pretty rapidly. Therefore, the only way that the Pakistanis feel that they can deter this is through having a more effective nuclear program. And of course, you know, China, Chinese, okay, they developed the nuclear program on their own, but the delivery system basically is developed with Chinese assistance. So... That's interesting. Yeah. So I mean, the, 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 there are, and and I mean, if you look at the, then the border problems that uh, India have had with China in the Himalayas, uh, you know, you have a, you, a significant set of problems there, and there's no question that looking ahead, you know, India is going to need Western allies to confront sort of Chinese expansionism. I think that that's interesting because it's it's similar to to what. Uh, Ambassador Saran said was one of the issues that they have with the Russians um, is that Russia is selling a lot of the same military ornaments, as he described it, to China, to, to China um, that, which it sells to India. And he said that that was a very un not, not a very comfortable position for, for us in India to be in. And so it is... Uh, interesting that he seemed to sort of downplay um, the, the the tensions with China. Yet it is uh, a lot of it is China that seems to be a recurrent threat in a lot of its its handlings and how it sees a lot of it, its relationships, such as with Pakistan, such as with with Russia. And you know, I I I, I completely agree with you that India will need the West. Um, a lot more in the coming years. And yet it seems kind of resistant to, uh, to, to sort of buddying up with, with, with the West with much enthusiasm at the moment. And I think it was very interesting, just harking back to that interview you did with the former Australian Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, because she was talking about, you know, how do we recruit India um, to our cause in terms of solidifying, you know, an alliance of countries so in, in, uh, in Asia to serve as a sort of counter West, um, uh, as a sort of counterpoint to a rising China. And, you know, we really need to get India to play a more active role in the Quad and in, and in regional dialogue, but it's 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 she described it as being quite quite tricky to to get the Indians to sim, sing from the same hy same hymn sheet uh, as the West when it comes to China. Well, I think Julie Bishop was right about that because I mean I would say that in a crisis the Indians are converted; they've already made their choices. But in terms of the way that they behave now. You know they want to sort of demonstrate their independence as you know highly consequ consequential 
uh, power in the region. And, you know, they don't want to be seen to be playing the Americans' game. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I can see the uh, Security Council in Delhi rubbing their hands with glee when the UK uh, and, 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 and the US announced the AUKUS agreement on the provision of nuclear submarines, um, well, nuclear attack submarines, to Australia. I mean, this plays right into their strategic priorities. And I, I mean, I just think India I, 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 I had had a certain amount of experience in dealing with the Indian government. <laughs> they are difficult. And they're deliberately Tell us about different. that, Richard. No, I'm not going to go into detail. But I mean, I went to India with Tony Blair and uh, we had some seminal meetings. This was after 9-11. Uh, and they were very good and they were very positive, but they were never easy. I mean, the, the, the Indians, you know, are definitely difficult in asserting their own identity. I, I don't blame them for that at all. I, I mean, I, can, I think I rather understand the position that they take and I'm sympathetic. But I mean, bear in mind, you know, India's well, it's economic and commercial importance, but it is the world's largest democracy. And as a democracy, with all its faults, it actually functions surprisingly well. And, you know, to accommodate the massive sort of diversity of the Indian population and to still have properly elected governments, which they do, I think is a stunning political achievement. So I'm a big admirer of, 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 of India um, generally, and I'm prepared as it were to tolerate their foibles and to, uh, and and you know and to say to people well okay they are going to be our allies in the future they're going to be important allies but we shouldn't necessarily expect them to behave the way we do and i think actually in the background that's where we are um and i, I think what you have to understand uh, when you're thinking about india is on a day-to-day -day basis rather than maybe on a long-term strategic basis. The main concern is always Pakistan uh, and the flashpoints like Kargil, like Kashmir. Um, you know where you know there's a, there's there's literally a running a running saw which is never going to be um, resolved or agreed because of the intransigence of both sides and. Um, that's how, you know, their thinking is, is their day-to-day -day thinking is dominated by those issues. And I think their long-term thinking now is dominated by the fear of what happens in China. India tends to prefer like diversity and power centres around the world, which is why it has all, all these multilateral agreements. It doesn't like any one country calling the shots. Is it more to do with regional dynamics or do they also have concerns about China's marital sort of aggressions to its neighbours? What is it about China that the Indians uh, are concerned about? Well, I think the primary strategic concern is India... Is, is India being encircled uh, by China as a maritime power? So you've got them in a very, I mean, the Chinese in a very strong position uh, in Burma. You've got them building, you know, strategic roads down through Burma to ports on the Indian Ocean. You've got significant Chinese involvement in Ceylon. Uh, Sri Lanka, and the construction of a port there, which the Salinese are now finding quite an embarrassment. Uh, and that was very much, as it were, the quid pro quo of the Chinese helping the government there defeat the Tamil Tigers. Um, and you, you've got a major Chinese port with a massive Belt and Road initiative coming down through Pakistan. India is worried about encirclement, and I think it's also very worried about its northern border. And of course, the Chinese domination of Tibet, um, it, its position in mm. Nepal, and, uh, and of course, the other point which I've made already really is, you know, there's India, which is an extraordinary democracy in its own way, and confronting an extraordinary autocracy which is becoming more and more autocratic. So, you know, India will strive, I think, to be, you know, China's main competitor.
both strategically and politically in that part of Asia. I, I mean, it's almost inevitable, I think. So I think that's really, really interesting because w- what I what I'm trying to understand is whether the Indians' main concern is that of influence, the kind of the encirclement, as you say, China is very, very close with Myanmar. It's obviously it, it, it's very close with Nepal. It's got ties to Pakistan. Um and and yes, there there is unease with the Himalayas, but I don't I don't know how realistic a, a, a concern that China would you know t- try to take a bite out of India the way that Vladimir Putin is taking bites out of Ukraine. But the fact that you, but you mentioned you have the world's biggest democracy of a similar size to China and will in fact overtake the population uh, of China in, in a few years, uh, given the, the growth in, in population and the fact that China is a huge autocracy. So the, that leads me to ask you, does China actually not have more to fear from India if it has a giant, huge democracy right next door to it where they hold general elections that take almost a year to carry out and they have a peaceful transfer of power at the end of every administration? Do the Chinese not look at that and think, oh gosh, we... The the biggest threat that the Chinese Communist Party faces is that from its own population. And what happens when the Chinese all of a sudden the penny drops and they say and they see what happens in India and think, "Ha, huh, why can't why can't we have have the same?" For, well, I think it's a very astute analysis. And you know, you could apply. Uh, I mean, if you look at the countries around India, uh, I, I mean, I'm thinking of Nepal. I'm thinking of Bangladesh. I'm thinking of Burma, um, all where India, I would argue, has a, strate- a st- legitimate strategic interest. And I, I, I'm sure that in a way there's a sort of competition for influence. And of course, the Indian influence, because it's a democracy and uh, you know, is a very vibrant, uh, youthful democracy, is probably very threatening to China's interests in those countries. So you can, as it were, imagine in the future how a contest might be played out. And uh, I mean, it, you know, one also has to consider, you know, Bangladesh and Pakistan in that equation, which are, you know, democratic to an extent, although have always been vulnerable as well to military control and military coup. Um, so, you know, their their commitment is 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 less to democracy, I think, is less profound and is more fragile. But I mean, look look at the Chinese reaction to the virus of democracy catching on in Hong Kong. Um, I mean, you've got an example there of the fear of the Chinese that little Hong Kong will, you know, not project COVID back into China, but would project the democratic virus backwards into China. And uh, in a way, uh, if you're if you're taking a longer term view of the regional parities and the way these nations counterbalance balance each other, uh, there is a complete sort of disconnect between the political traditions of these two giants. Um, and I, I mean, I think looking to the future, one is going to see a sort of ring around China of a much more proactive, strategic Japan in in, in international affairs. I mean, no, no longer really uh, virtually being a, a country without armed forces. Um, obviously, Australia building up its capability with the help of the UK and and the United States in particular, and then obviously the you know the the other country in this ring of crucial importance uh, is India, absolutely crucial importance in India, and you know the containment of China if if it continues down its current track is going to depend on our alliance with Japan and India in in particular, I mean, assuming that we already have that close relationship with Australia. And I mean, Australia is in the process of becoming a more consequential regional military power. And then you've got the smaller players like Singapore, but I mean, they they are strategically so small that I'm not really including them in this analysis, although they are actually potentially quite important too. Taiwan as well. 
I think so. I think Singapore are, are are fascinating because obviously the size of their army is is totally minuscule, but they are extremely high tech. And I I don't know much about their cyber capabilities, but I expect they are extremely oh, so, uh, so. extremely capable. And they do, of course, have that really interesting relationship with yeah, the Israeli yeah. the Israeli military and a lot of joint ventures in in that realm. But I I do think there's you know we talk about containment. It's also worth making the point that in, in India has a close relationship with Israel too, which we don't know much mm. about, and and I mean that that is a dimension which is sort of hidden um, because I think one can assume, and I'm not going to go into detail here, that the Indian nuclear program has been helped. By the Israelis. That is an extremely tantalising thread, uh, Richard. <laughs> that I'm going to have to pull a bit more on. Tell 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 us more because I I uh, I know very very little about the relationship with Israel and India. Well, I I know a fair amount about the relationship, and of course, Israel technically is not a nuclear power. So how could it have helped India with its nuclear program? But let us say <laughs> we can make the assumption that that has probably happened, uh, and that. Uh, you know, the, the, there are relationships which are largely unwritten about and uh, go on beneath the radar. And I, I, I personally think that in all probability, the Israeli-Indian relationship is pretty important. That's very interesting. But you were saying um, just a short while ago that the relations that the um, the Pakistani nuclear program, y- your your uh, assessment, although you did caveat, you did say that it, you were a little out of date. But you thought that the Pakistani nuclear program was way more advanced than the Indians. But does that not sort of not speak well of Israeli partnership if the Indians? Uh, uh, nuclear program is is lagging behind the Pakistani? Well, I think the Indians would have used the links with with the Israelis to try to catch up Pakistan. So, I, I mean, there's no question that there has been a type of arms race. And, you know, if you look to the one place in the world where the threat of nuclear war is most imminent, it is probably, even with the Ukraine crisis flowing between, actually between India and Pakistan. And I mean, I think it's worrying. And that is largely because... If there were a crisis, India's policy, uh, Pakistan's policy of first use to overwhelm the, you know, conventional might, military might of India, is a very, very worrying aspect of that regional situation. That is a subject for another podcast. Richard, thank you so much for discussing with me today. Julia, as always, a pleasure and a good discussion. I think definitely. That's it for this week's episode of One Decision. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you are enjoying our shows, please consider giving us a rating on Apple, Spotify or wherever you listen to us. From me and the team, thank you for listening. 